Long before Neil Armstrong took that one small step for man and that giant leap for mankind, Walt Disney was sending Disneyland guests on the ride of a lifetime to the moon and back. It was quite an adventure to be had. As with all Disney attractions, it was the perfect blend of fantasy and reality, designed to convince riders that they were experiencing an actual space mission, even if just for a few minutes. In 1955, when the ride opened in Disney's brand new park, a real moon landing was still a distant dream, and there was no better place on Earth to debut this glorious vision of the future than Disney's Tomorrowland. Excited visitors entering the Disneyland Park could easily spot the red and white rocket looming in the distance. Located at the far end of Tomorrowland, the 80-foot giant stood tall, reaching for the sky as if ready to take off at any moment. Bearing the bold red TWA logo to announce its corporate sponsor, Transworld Airlines, the steel and aluminum rocket designed by Imagineer John Hench promised a new kind of ride a trip into the future with so much attention to detail that reality would easily be suspended. Excitement was built as anxious riders passed the Circarama Theater and the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea exhibit. Some would stop to marvel at the scientific displays by corporate sponsors on the way. Others hurried by them past the flight circle. As with all Disneyland attractions, the short trek up to the ride was almost as exciting as the main event. The stoic rocket towered over the entrance to the pre-show spaceport. Signs displayed and explained the wondrous journey that was about to take place. The ultra-modern design of the pre-show area added authenticity to the experience. Once inside, passengers were treated to a 15-minute briefing session. A 16mm film displayed on large screens played while they waited for their flight. A history of space exploration followed by a preview of the anticipated flight kept visitors entertained during the 15-minute wait between flights. The film concluded with a launch of a TWA Moonliner just like the one outside the entrance. A combination of live action and animation wowed visitors with a visual display, complete with a fiery blast propelling the rocket above the Earth. Upon completion of the pre-show, passengers were led to the space chamber for their flight. Such was the fate of the Flying Saucers. This attraction, which opened in Tomorrowland in 1961, was intended as a pioneering step towards a hovercraft project, which at the time was considered visionary and futuristic. However, Problems with the attraction, in combination with the shifting moods of customers in a climate of rapidly expanding expectations about the nature and scope of our technological future, led to its closure a mere five years later in 1966. Despite this fact, however, this attraction has become something of a legend amongst theme park aficionados. In the five short years of its existence, the Flying Saucers achieved something few other attractions ever have, absolute uniqueness. Its innovative technological design made it the first and last ride of its kind. And this, in turn, has given this attraction a place of its own in history. The idea for the Flying Saucers was hatched under unlikely seeming circumstances. It began in 1960, when after the failure of an aquatic attraction called Phantom Boats, Walt Disney decided to commission a new attraction called a Duck Bump. However, this idea was quickly overtaken by a new one, a flying saucer attraction, based on hovercraft technologies which were then newly invented and cutting edge. 
sometime around uh, the late 50s, uh, there was a lot of interest in what people would call a ground effects vehicle, uh, where it would be a vehicle with a fan, and it would uh, create air underneath the vehicle, and there would be a skirt around it, and uh, these, these were called ground effects vehicles. And some of the military was looking at great big ones, and the home builders were all making these little small ones. And so one day a guy came by to show Walt this uh, home build flying saucer, you know, ground effect vehicle, and they brought it to the studio, and uh, Roger, uh, Roger Brogy and Walt Disney looked at it and said, well, uh, we want Bob Kerr to look at it and see what you think. So I drove it around the uh, sound stage, around the studio lot, and it was an absolute nightmare. This thing had a great big horizontal fan with a really loud motor, and all it did was blow a lot of dust. Uh, but it was a really fun to drive. The thing was really fast. I caught on how to uh, ride it really, really quick. But my report to Walt was that uh, no way would we have a safe operation with a, a gasoline engine and a great big fan. The first time uh, a fan uh, blades uh, broke and flew off, uh, you know, we could, we could kill people with a thing like that. So the idea of using that type of a flying saucer uh, wasn't going to work. But uh, Walt at that time wanted to do a flying saucer. Meantime, he had aero development up in Mountain View, uh, Ed Morgan and Carl Bacon, figuring out, well, how could you do a flying saucer without a motor and without a fan? So they turned the equation around and says, okay, well, we'll have the air uh, blow up into the vehicle from the ground. And that led to the idea, well, yes, you could have big uh, air chambers, and then you could have fans feed that, and then you could uh, blow air up through holes, but then that would waste a lot of air. So the idea was, well, why don't you have a, a tricky valve that opens up when the vehicle's over it, but closes when the vehicle's not over it. And that was a very clever, simple invention that uh, Carl Bacon uh, came up with that a lot of people still don't understand quite how that thing uh, worked. It's been uh, extensively written, written up in stories, and the e-ticket has an extremely good a detailed story of how that's done. But that was the idea, and Ed and Carl built a, a temporary uh, test deck and they built a temporary flying saucer and it worked just absolutely gorgeous. So I was given the job to take the basic um, test car that uh, uh, Carl and Ed had come up with and style it into a, a Disneyland style flying saucer. So it only took a matter of a few days to figure the design out, make the drawings, and it was a very simple car which uh, they took my drawings and they built the cars. It was one of the easiest vehicles I ever uh, built uh, because it had no moving parts. Uh, that's the kind of vehicle I like. There was nothing that you could break and nothing would wear out. Uh, all you do was just sit on it. And uh, So that's how the flying saucer, uh, the shape of the vehicle came along. And I patterned uh, some of the design details of people who were watching early spacecraft between the Mercury and the Gemini. The Gemini had uh, certain uh, features in the nose cone area. So I took those features and uh, made that into the flying saucer. So for people who really know their history, a little radial lines on our flying saucer came right off the uh, NASA's uh, Gemini spacecraft.